Vietnam. How are you guys doing this morning? Am I on now? We good? It's not their fault. It's mine. I forgot to turn my butt on. All right. Good. Uh, well, hey, thank you for being here. As you just saw, and as Tim mentioned, we're kicking off a brand new series called The Gospel Revolution. When Carl asked me um, if I would kick off the, se- the series, I was pretty stoked. Uh, and yeah, I use words like stoked. I was raised in Southern California for a bit. So um, get used to it. We'll deal with it. But Carl said, hey, I want you to kick off uh, the Gospel Revolution series. I said, you want me to kick off the series? He goes, well, I don't want you to, but I need you to. I'm going to be out of town. And I said, okay, well, uh, that's fair. That'll work. Uh, but we're really excited about the Gospel Revolution and, and just what it could mean for our church, what it could mean for us personally, and what it could mean for our families. As a matter of fact, we believe so much in the gospel and how revolutionary it is and what it can do for our lives that um, we are making a concerted effort across everything to talk about the gospel revolution. As a matter of fact, your kids that are over uh, in Kids Rock right now are talking about the gospel revolution. All the way up from preschool, all the way through high school, all the way into our life groups, we're talking about the gospel revolution. And if you haven't gotten involved in a life group, if you haven't gotten involved with a group of people uh, to walk alongside you, to love you, to build relationships with, to study the gospel, we encourage you to get involved in a life group because we're going to be doing this for the next eight weeks. Make a commitment to that. See how God can transform your lives. And as a matter of fact, if you're a family here, we have, um, we've done a couple things. And inside your bulletin, on the inside of the insert, every week you will see a Next Generations Family Challenge. Because your preschoolers, your kids, your middle school students, your high school students will be talking about the gospel revolution. We challenge you guys as a family to make the gospel a central part of your lives for the next eight weeks. And hopefully it continues on past that, of course. But for the next eight weeks, just take these challenges. The challenges start off here today. We would love for you guys to do that. Inside is a gospel revolution reading plan. And this is for everybody. This isn't just for the families. This is for everybody. This is an eight-week program, um, five days a week. They give you Saturdays and Sundays off, which is nice of them, I guess. Saturdays and Sundays off. But we want you to be here talking about the gospel revolution, hearing the messages, and studying the gospel. And just see how impactful it can be in your life, in your family, and in your church. So we're talking about this gospel revolution. So we should kind of, you know, talk about what's it all about. What is the gospel? Well, Carl mentioned last week that the gospel is really simple. The gospel literally means, anybody remember? Good news. Good news. So if the gospel means good news, then what is the good news? Here's the good news. God loved us so much and desired a relationship with us so deeply that he created us with a choice to love him or rebel against him. The first human beings chose to rebel against God's way. And so sin entered into this world. Now our relationship with God was broken. And God saw that, and so he came up with a plan, a rescue plan. A plan of reconciliation, of reclaiming everything that he had created. And so he sent his son Jesus into this world to pay the penalty for our sins, both past, present, and future. Everyone, all for all time. To pay that price. To die a death on a cross. But it didn't stop there. Jesus died on the cross. Was dead. Buried. And rose again. Defeating hell. Death. The grave. And Satan. Once and for all. When he walked away from him. And when he ascended into heaven. He rules on high. And is reclaiming and reconciling all things back to himself. And for those of us that put our trust and our hope and our faith in Him, we will spend eternity with God. And even more exciting, God invites you and I when we put our hope and our trust and our faith in Jesus Christ to be on mission with Him. To be on mission of reclaiming and reconciling all things to Himself. That is the good news of the gospel. And that's exciting. And it's revolutionary. That's the good news. That Jesus died for sinners. To make a way so that you and I could be made right with God. Isn't that beautiful? That's the most exciting news. And that's why it's called the gospel. That's why it's called the good news. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about that. Why it's revolutionary. How it's revolutionary. How it impacts and changes our lives and changes the world around us. That's the good news. That's the gospel part. So what's a revolution? 
Well, a revolution is this. A revolution is the movement of an object in a circular or elliptical course around another or about an axis or center. You're confused, right? <laughs> Me too, that has nothing to do with the gospel. I just wanted to sound smart for a minute. Okay. <laughs> Revolution, when we talk about it, is this. Dramatic and wide-reaching change in the way something works or in people's ideas about it. Revolution is dramatic and wide-sweeping change in the way something works or in people's ideas about it. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with the gospel. There's nothing wrong with the good news, right? The way it's been working for 2,000 years, that's, that's been perfectly great, right? No problem. It's working just fine. But there is something wrong with the way uh, it works out in our lives. Because we haven't been doing it a very good service, have we? We, we kind of hide it away. We're not, we, we don't talk about it as much. We don't live it out. So there needs to be a dramatic, wide-reaching change in the way it live, it's lived out in our lives. And there also needs to be a dramatic and wide-reaching change in the way people think about it. Because Christians and the gospel and Jesus have gotten a really, really bad rap in our society today, wouldn't you say? I mean, wouldn't you agree that sometimes Christians don't present themselves in the best light? Right? We all watch the news. We all see the negative effects of Christianity and the way some of the people treat that. I remember uh, being in San Diego and being in this college group, and nobody wanted anything to do uh, from San Diego State with our college group, hardly. Until we started to figure out why. There was a guy that would stand in the middle of the quad of San Diego State on a soapbox or on a milk crate with a blow horn and just. Uh, say the most vile, disgusting things to people as they walked by. As the girls would walk by, he would call them whores and sluts, like yelling this into a microphone. You need Jesus. Oh, that's exactly, yeah, yep, thank you for calling me that and telling me I need Jesus. And maybe that's how you became associated with Christianity. Or maybe it was for the images on the television of people just not living out the true gospel. And so there needs to be wide-reaching change, dramatic, wide-reaching change in the way people think about the gospel. And it can come through us. So the good news, the good news of Jesus Christ, that he came and died for sinners so that we could be made right with God, that good news needs to be dramatic, wide-reaching change in the way that's lived out in our lives, the way we talk about it, and the way people think about it in this world. Would you agree? Good. Good thing we're studying this then. Why is the gospel revolutionary? The gospel is revolutionary for just a couple reasons. Number one, the gospel gives us a brand new way of approaching change. It gives us a brand new way of approaching change. There's two ways of change. The first is mechanical change. What we're going to call in this series religious change. It's change that happens from outside forces. It's trying to change your heart by doing things outside. We call this religious change. And here's the problem with religious change. Religious change works for the approval of God. Religious change works for the approval of God. You're trying to change your heart and trying to earn God's love and trying to earn God's approval by doing all the right things. And you think by doing all those right things, something's going to change what's inside you or, or God's going to love you more or God's, you're going to finally earn God's approval. Well, here's the problem with that. You can never do enough. Because the Bible tells us that you can't earn God's love, approval, grace, acceptance, forgiveness. You can't earn that. You can't buy it. You can't win it. The only thing you can do is accept it as a gift, freely, the way he was meant for it to be. Look at what Titus, chapter 3, verse 3 to 5 says. When God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things that who? We, we. we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. There's that gospel message. And you guys will see this gospel message of Jesus paying the price on the cross, dying, being uh, dying, being buried, rising again. You guys will see that gospel message. It weaves its way through all of Scripture, and it's right here. He saved us because of the righteous things, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He washed away our sins. See, there's nothing we can do to earn, to buy, to to win, to, 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 to purchase God's love, God's acceptance, God's forgiveness. We can only accept it. So that's religious change. Change that happens from outside forces. Trying to do things, the right things around us. Hoping to change our hearts. Or hoping to earn God's power in some way. And then there was organic change. What we're going to call in this series, gospel change. And this is what we want to focus on in this, in this series. Gospel change works from the approval of God. Gospel change works from the approval of God. 
See, when you begin to realize the gospel message that God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for you so that you could be made right with God, and all you need to do is put your trust, your hope, your faith in him, believe in him, accept that gift, that begins to change you from the inside out. Just like that song that we sang, from the inside out. I want you to look at Romans chapter 12. This is actually the scripture that was read uh, during that song. And it's from a paraphrase of the Bible, but I love the way that it puts it. Because it talks about how our everyday normal lives become changed when we put our hope and trust in Christ. So here is what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life. And place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God and you'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to Him. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to the level of its immaturity, God brings out the best of you. He develops well-formed maturity. See, it says the culture around us just tears us apart and drags us down. Because the outside forces, the mechanical change, it doesn't work. But God works differently. He works from the inside out. He changes our heart. And because the gospel changes us, it changes the world around us. And that's what we're going to look at today. Would you guys stand with me and read the scripture, this passage that we're going to focus on today? And this is such a beautiful uh, presentation of the gospel. It's one of my uh, favorite messages in all of scripture. And it's found in John chapter 1. And uh, it's verses 1 to 17. We cut out a couple parts. Um, uh, but you can read the whole thing when you get there. But I would love for you guys to read this one, shall we? In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. The One who is the true light who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave them the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with the physical birth resulting from human passion or plan but a birth that comes from God. So the Word became human and made His home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Isn't that beautiful? Let's pray. God, thank You for this beautiful passage of Scripture that describes You sending Your Son, Jesus, into this world as the true light the light that gives life to all mankind. God, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for this light that changes us from the inside out and calls us to be light to a world around us. God, we pray as we enter into this message of uh, the gospel revolution and about uh, how the gospel changes us, God, I pray that you would uh, impact our hearts and, and, and cause us to desire to go out into this world and to make change for you. We love you, God. And we're blessed to be here this morning. We're excited to be here and excited for what you want to do in our lives and in our families and in our church through the gospel revolution. In your name we pray. Amen. So the gospel changes us. And when the gospel changes us, it should pour out into our lives and change the world around us. See, the gospel changes you and I. And the gospel, the good news of Jesus... All, as John chapter 1 said, all we have to do is believe in Him and accept that gift. Because you can't some, accept something you don't believe in, right? Like I can look at you and go, hey, you want 20 bucks? Huh? You, okay. Do you believe that I have it in my hand? No? You don't believe in it, right? So you can't believe in it. You're right, I don't have it. Sorry. 
I totally led you on. Maybe I'll give you a candy bar after or something funny. <laughs> but you can't accept something you don't believe in. If I did have 20 bucks, but he didn't believe it, he couldn't have accepted it. Does that make sense? So you're like, well, you tell me I don't have to do anything, then he had not tell me I have to believe in him. Well, it only makes sense. You can't accept something that you don't believe in. You with me there? Okay. So Jesus says, believe in me and accept this gift that I've given you. Believe and accept. It's that easy. And here's the amazing thing about Christianity. Is it's the only religion like this. All of the other religions say there's these things that you have to do, 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 do. And all those other religions can be spelled D-O. But Christianity, it's already been done. Christianity is spelled D-O-N-E. There's nothing you have to do because everything has already been done for you in the work of Jesus. And that's amazing. And because of that gospel, it gets in us and it changes us. So if the gospel changes us, that begs the question, um, what did it change us from? What did it change us from? John chapter 1 says that to those who believe in him and accept him, they gave the right to be called what? Children of God. So when the gospel changes us into children of God, that begs the question, what were we before we were children of God? Well, let's look at it. Colossians chapter 1 says this. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, see there's the, 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 the gospel again. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. And Romans, uh, the book of Romans, says this about us. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. There's the gospel again. Sinners. What is sin? Sin is rebelling against God's way. It's saying, God, forget your way. I don't like your way. I'm going to do it my way. That's what sin is. Saying, God, don't want to do it your way. Don't want to do things. So we're rebellious against God. We're God's enemies. But since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of His Son while we were still His enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of His Son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. So not only are we children, but it calls us friends of God. It tells us that we're in this beautiful new relationship with God. But before that, it says that we were his enemies, that we were separated, that we were rebellious towards God. I don't know if anybody's ever been in a war. I have not. But when I think of enemy, I think of somebody who's trying to kill or destroy me, right? Sometimes I think my children are my enemies. <laughs> a few weeks ago, I had really, really hurt my back and neck. And all my kids wanted to do? Wrestle. Absolutely. Daddy's hurt. <laughs> like sharks smelling blood in the water, right? <laughs> they wanted to destroy me. Luckily, I have a good chiropractor. He's a good dude. Jared Dawson, good guy. Fix me right up. So you have to move. All right, good. Uh, they're like my enemies. And so I don't know if you've ever been in war. I don't know if you consider your children your enemies. Um, I don't know if you have some that person down the street that, you know, you don't know how their tire got flat. You're just saying, you know. Uh, I don't know if there's somebody like that in your life. But I want you to picture your enemy. The greatest enemy you've ever had in your life. That person that you just, oh, man. Somebody who tried to destroy you, somebody who tried to, to, to wreck your name, somebody who tried to take everything from you. Picture that enemy. Now I want you to picture making them your child. That's tough, isn't it? And I'm not just talking about the child who tries to destroy us, and sometimes we're like, that ain't my kid. You know, when they're throwing a fit in the grocery store in front of everybody. I know whose kid that is, that ain't mine, but man, those parents, they're terrible, that is awful. Somebody better do something about that. Um, not that kind of child, but the kind of child when a father holds his newborn son for the first time. And all I can do is hold this gentle thing, hoping for the best for him. Looking at it loving him with nothing but care and love. That kind of child. From enemy. Isn't that amazing? That's the gospel. 
That's how the gospel changes us. We go from being rebellious, sinners, enemies of God, to his dearly loved children, to his friends. We're transformed, we're changed. The gospel not only changes us, but the gospel changes the world around us. And here's the amazing thing. When we enter into this, this relationship, this wonderful relationship, as, as, as uh, Romans describes it, with Christ, because of the gospel change inside of us, then we begin to do the things that are right on the outside. See, it's not that mechanical change. It's that organic change. The mechanical change says, I have to do all these right things in order to be made right with God. But gospel change says, no, 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 no. God wants to make you right with him through his son, Jesus. And then you will do what's right because you love what is right. It bleeds out from you. When the gospel invades and changes your life, it bleeds out from you to every corner of your life. And because of the gospel change in you, the gospel changes the world around you through you. The gospel changes the world around us. Look at what happens um, when, when the gospel enters to us. We become ambassadors of the gospel. Ambassadors of the gospel. We call our membership here at Foundations ambassadors. There's an ambassador class today. I think there's probably still time to get in on that if you wanted to look into membership or uh, becoming an ambassador of Foundations Church. But we become ambassadors of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, um, it says this. For, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. There's that reclaiming of the world, right? There's that making everything right in the world. He was reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. This is the wonderful message he has given us to tell others. See, there's that gospel thread again, right? This is the wonderful message that he's given us to tell others. We are Christ's ambassadors. And God is using us to speak to you. We urge you as though Christ himself were here pleading with you. Be reconciled to God. Come back to God. We get the opportunity to be ambassadors for Christ, to speak to people and say, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God. There's the gospel again. See how it weaves through almost everything. It's beautiful. And we get to be ambassadors. We get to be the ones who plead with people. Come back to God. He's waiting for you. So what actually is an ambassador? Here's the definition of an ambassador. An ambassador is a person who acts as a representative of or promoter of someone or something. An ambassador is, who, is someone who acts as a representative of or a promoter for someone or something. So when we become ambassadors, we actually leave our old life behind. The things that we used to stand for, the things that we used to represent, the things that we used to promote, those are gone, those are over with, those are dead. And we actually put on this new wardrobe and we stand for new things. We stand for amazing things, good things, beautiful. Oh, sorry, just, I forgot this jersey, yeah. Um, when I put on this jersey, I become an ambassador of what? Of who? I want you all to say it. The Red Sox, the greatest team in baseball, right? I become a promoter for them. And here's the thing, I see a lot of people who wear Broncos gear or, or Rockies gear. I'm sorry, uh, but uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, you guys are going down. Um, and it becomes super easy for us to be ambassadors of our favorite sports teams, doesn't it? Isn't it easy for us to be ambassadors? And we talk about it all during the week. Or maybe some of you talk about your favorite TV show, or that movie you just saw, or that band you just discovered. We become really good ambassadors of those things, don't we? But how many of us represent or promote Christ half as much as we do our favorite sports team or our favorite TV show or our favorite movie. <laughs> Ambassador is a representative or a promoter of something. The Bible tells us that when we are changed by the gospel, we become Christ's ambassadors to a world that desperately needs it. I'll take this off now. I just don't want to make anybody jealous. 
We become Christ's ambassadors to a world around us. And the world is changed through us because we become this world's ambassadors. Here's the other thing that happens when we are changed by the gospel. In John chapter 1, it says that the light that was coming into the world was giving life to all mankind. And we actually become the light of Christ in a dark and dying world. Because we have the light of Christ inside of us. This isn't something new agey like, ooh, you have the light inside you. That's not what we're talking about here. This is talking about the truth. The gospel. Jesus. And in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus calls us light. He says, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hill top that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your Father in heaven. Your light. Let your good deeds shine. Now, I want to take a minute and just do, do a little sidetrack here. Because a lot of people use this phrase, um, witness always and when necessary use words, right? And they say, St. Francis of Assisi says this. Here's the problem. St. Francis of Assisi never said that. He never said that. It's never ascribed to him anywhere, aside from like the last hundred years or so. And the reason we know that St. Francis of Assisi didn't say that is because we know he would have never have lived like that. He went out and did good deeds, but then he backed it up by telling people why he did those good things. See that phrase, witness always, and when necessary use words, while good, kind of lets us off the hook from having to actually verbally share our faith. And that's not at all what God calls us to do. Because when you do those good things, you need to give a reason. The Bible tells us to always be prepared to give a reason. Right? So it's not just by being able to do those things, but be by being able to say, hey, look, it's not the good, it's not me. I'm not doing this. It's Christ in me, living out through me. That's why these things happen. But God says, be a light, let your good deeds shine so that they may praise your Father in heaven. God calls us light. And here's just a few attributes of light that I love, that I think we as Christians are called to be. First off, light brings color. Light brings color to a dull place. You know, without light, there's no color. Imagine how boring that would be, right? We'd all just be saying everything in like monotones. But light brings color, and color brings vibrancy, and, 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 and beauty, and brightness to life. And as Christians, that's what we're called to be. The problem is, is that too many of us walk around like Christian Eeyores. How's church? It was good. Yeah, how's things going? Uh, you know, tell me about Jesus. He's pretty awesome. Man, I want some of what you got. Like that, I want. As Christians, we're called not to be boring, not to be, not to be, uh, you know, just boring. We're called to bring vibrancy to life, to be color, to be light. One of my favorite lines from C.S. Lewis is found in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, uh, C.S. Lewis writes about this great lion named Aslan, for those of you guys that haven't read it. And Aslan represents Christ in this children's story. And there's a scene where the Pevins kids, they, they walk through a magical wardrobe, and trust me, it's a good book. Okay. Um, they walk through this wardrobe, they go into this land named Narnia, and they end up at the house of these talking beavers. And Mr. and Mrs. Beaver are fixing them dinner and taking care of them, and Mr. Beaver begins to tell them the story of Aslan, the great lion. And Lucy, one of the girls, says, oh, Aslan, the great lion. I should be quite terrified to meet him. Is he safe? And Mr. Beaver looks at Lucy and he says, oh, my dear, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he's not safe. Of course he's not safe. But he's good, I tell you. He's the king. I love that. That speaks of the adventure, the wild ride that following Christ can be sometimes. The fact that God kicks us out of our comfort zones and says, look, following me is not always going to be safe and easy. But I'll tell you what, it's going to be good because I'm the king. It's about living brave, not safe. <laughs> to live brave, not safe is the call of the Christian life when we become light in a dark place. And light 
brings life to lifeless places. Without light, there is no life. There's no plants. There's no weeds. That'd be good. There's no vegetables. I'm okay with that. But then you get to the fact that there's no fruit. Okay, I like cherries. I like peaches. You know, like I like some fruit. Without light, there's no grain. Without grain, there's no beef. With no beef, there's no steak. You know what I'm saying? Light brings life to lifeless places. And that's what you and I are called to be, givers of life. And the last thing that light does, light is meant to chase away the darkness. All throughout scripture, there's this battle going on between dark and light. And dark is often associated with the broken things of this world. Good versus bad, life versus death, hope versus despair, joy versus sorrow. Dark and light, dark and light. And that's why in John chapter 1, when it says the light has overcome the darkness, it has chased it away. The darkness has not been able to comprehend the light. As a matter of fact, did you know there's really not such a thing as darkness? You know that? All darkness is, is the absence of light. So as Christians, we're just called to be people who bring light into places where there isn't any. That's an amazing privilege that when the gospel changes us, it begins to change the world around us and through us. Light chases away the dark. It brings color. It brings life. One of the charges that I give to my students when we talk about going out into the world and making a difference is this. I tell them, chase the dark. Chase the dark. It came from when Caleb was a, a little bit younger. He used to just love play with flashlights. I remember we were in the store one time, uh, and, and he grabbed this flashlight, and he goes, Hey, Daddy, Daddy, can I get this flashlight? Uh, I want to go chase some dark. And that phrase just hit me like, bam. That's what we as Christians are called to do. Fearlessly and recklessly chase the dark. Not because of who we are, but because of the light of Christ inside us, giving light and life into a dark world. In closing, I'd like to tell you a story about color, about vibrancy, about life in a lifeless place. It's a story about a slide. Some you may be wondering, what, what does a slide have to do with life, and color, and vibrancy in the gospel? Let me give you a little bit of context. We talked about how when the gospel comes alive in us and when we live it out, it changes the world around us, right? Did you know that in Ukraine, the average Ukrainian woman has five abortions in her lifetime? Just a means of birth control. And most times in Ukraine, if you're born with any sort of physical or mental uh, disability, you're not wanted. And so if your child is born with one of those, the, the dad usually takes off, he usually... Um, leaves and leaves a single mom to care for this now physically or mentally disabled child. And these disabled uh, children uh, do not live very good lives because they don't, they're not accepted in society. It's a very proud society. They don't want to admit that there's problems, that, there's, that, 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 that this part of society even exists. And so they make it very difficult for children to be out in public. As a matter of fact, we were working at one of these camps that I'm going to talk about here in just a minute. We had to take one of the campers home and just give you an idea of what the day-to-day -day life for some of these children are. She got sick. We had to take her home. So we hopped in a van with her mom and drove to where they lived. And it was a very project-style apartment building in, in a town called Shatomer, which is kind of a, it's got a metropolitan side, Eastern European side to it, but most of it is very poor. And so we pulled up to this kind of project-type building. And the mom and her daughter lived on the seventh floor. No elevator. In the very back farthest corner, in a small two-room apartment with one window. And so in order for her to get her daughter out of the house every day, um, which never happened because she would have had to leave her daughter in the apartment, carry her wheelchair down the seven flights of stairs out to the landing, then go back upstairs, get all of their stuff, put it there, and then go back upstairs and finally get her daughter so going out every day is not an option. Even going to the doctor can be one of the hardest things ever. So for most of the year, most of these kids live lives that are marked by rejection, sadness, loneliness, and being locked away in a top floor apartment, left only to gaze out of the window. This was life in Chitoma. Until a Christian organization called Mission to Ukraine set up their offices right in the middle of downtown. 
Mission to Ukraine began to address some of the issues happening there in Ukraine. They began to talk to and counsel women who were considering abortions as an option into keeping their children. And they didn't just leave it there. They would support these women with food and diapers and clothing and everything that they need to successfully raise their child and parents in classes and sharing the gospel with them. And they have this Lifesavers program. And they're teaching abstinence in all of the schools and that there's other ways. And it's become a beautiful thing. But one of the problems that they also tackled were these forgotten the physically and mentally disabled students. And so that every year now they run a summer camp for two weeks where kids can come to the summer camp and maybe for the first time in their life they can come to a place where they can experience joy, experience a place where they are unconditionally loved and accepted and really for the first time in their lives a chance to feel normal. And so when I first went, one of the things that they wanted to do is they wanted to give these kids an experience that they never would have the opportunity to have something that they've never done before. And so they found this small little company in downtown Chitomer that has the inflatables and the bounce houses and everything, and they rented an inflatable slide. And they brought it to the camp. They had contracted it for three hours. And when the people came to set up the slide and they see all these physically and mentally disabled kids, they bought. They said, I, I don't know if we can do this. We don't want to be liable for any injuries. We don't know uh, how to interact with these. And they could, the camp director convinced them to stay. And so for the next eight hours, myself, some of our students, and the Ukrainian staff had the privilege of carrying kids who were so crippled by cerebral palsy or Down syndrome up this rickety old wooden ladder to the top of an inflatable slide. As we got to the top of the slide, the sheer look of terror on these kids' faces was amazing. But halfway down, that terror was exchanged for joy and laughter. And they would get off and get in line again. And we would pick them up out of their wheelchairs and carry them up this rickety wooden ladder here on the side. There's a good look of terror right there. <laughs> and then it was exchanged for joy. And to see these kids feel loved and to feel normal and to feel accepted and to experience life and joy and laughter still brings tears to my eyes. At the end of the day, they were only supposed to be there for three hours. We stayed for eight. At the end of the day, the people who directed this, my buddy Roma, the people who directed the uh, inflatable slide came up to our camp directors, Ira and Oksana. And they said we had no, with tears in their eyes, they, had, they said we had no idea what we were about to do. It is amazing what you do for these children. They got to share the gospel with them. And the people who own the slide said, the kids in your program can come down to our facility and enjoy themselves free of charge anytime they want. The kids went down to that. They took them up on it. <laughs> they went down to downtown Chitomer, and across the street there was a chocolatier. And the chocolatier sees all these mentally and physically disabled kids going into this place. And he's going, that's not right. What is going on? So he goes across the street to hand, ask what happens. And the person at the at says, I, I don't know, it's this organization, they love these kids. And so he asked them what happened. They shared the gospel and now God's changing the world through them. And the chocolatier looks at him and says, I want to invite your kids over to my chocolate shop. I want to teach them how to make chocolate and eat these sweets. And you know what? Just down the road from that, there was a bowling alley. And the bowling alley saw what was happening at the chocolatier. And they got invited to go bowling. And it went on and on and on and on of the slide, because of the gospel. Sometimes we think the gospel has to be this enormous, amazing presentation. We have to know all the answers, and we have to be able to point people to the theological reasons of why God died for them. And sometimes it's as simple as an inflatable slide. Sometimes it's as simple as a shovel at a neighbor's house, scooping out the sludge the debris left from the flood. Sometimes it's as simple as baking a hot meal and taking it to that shut-in who has no way of providing it for themselves. Sometimes it's as simple as a bag of groceries left on the porch of a single mom who's struggling to make ends meet. The gospel lived out in a million different small ways can change this world. <clears throat> Not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus is and what he's done for us.
So let me ask you this question. What will be your slide? How will you let the gospel change you and change the world around you? When you leave today, we actually have a slide. Not just for the kids, but for you as adults. I challenge you to take your kids up, to go down and watch them experience joy, experience happiness, have a little bit of fun, and realize that some things are simple. Sometimes God uses the simple things in this world to teach us about it. We're going to move into a time of communion. And communion is uh, set aside for those of us who have put our hope and trust and faith in Jesus. And maybe today, for the first time, you said, I want that. I want the gospel to change me. I want the good news of Jesus inside. And if that's you, then that's amazing. That's awesome. I would love for you to come share it with me, share it with Dan, share it with one of our pastors, share it with somebody. And we would invite you to take communion. But communion is for those who have put their trust, their faith in Christ. And the price that he, we, that he paid as we remember the price that he paid. His death on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection. Until he comes again. We take the bread. We take the juice. And we remember Christ's sacrifice. So maybe you're here today and for the first time you've accepted that gospel. The good news. We invite you to come. Or maybe you are just figuring out ways to live out the gospel in the world around you. Ask God to show you some simple things, some simple ways that you can be the good news to other people and allow God to change this world through you. I'm going to pray and our service hosts are going to come forward and serve the offering. Just take the bread, take the drink and uh, in your own time, uh, just take that. If you need gluten-free, we have it in the back. And please, let me just say that there's no shame in passing the plate. Nobody's going to look at you and be like, oh, that guy didn't take it. Nobody's going to do that. Nobody's going to look at you. Nobody's going to judge you. If you just need to get things right with God and you don't feel you're in the place to take that or, or you don't have that relationship, then just go ahead and pass it, pass it on. Nobody will look at you differently. But I'm going to pray and we're going to serve and then we'll continue on worship. Father God, thank you for the Son, Jesus, that you sent to die in our place so that we could be made right with you. God, thank you for the good news of the gospel changing us, transforming our lives from enemies into your dearly loved children, from, from those who are rebellious to being ambassadors of your good news to a dark and dying world that needs you now more than ever. God, please let us allow the gospel to transform our lives and let us take it into our families, into our schools, into our workplaces, and into the world around us. Father, we love you. We thank you for this gift of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen.